Mm -hmm. We don't think that there's any reason for carrying on with the war. It's now got mixed up with two other things. One is a protest against what the students say is repression and curbs on free speech in Egypt. They, they say there is no democracy here. Wound up with protest over the death of the student who died on Monday. So we're beginning to see the impact of the cut in base rates feeding through to uh, people's pockets. I think the other thing about uh, the rate cut today is that we had a little bit of good news yesterday about the situation in Germany. There's been some tax increases there, and that seems to have reduced the chances in the near term of the uh, German... Back to you later, because the British briefing, Colonel Barry Stevens in Riyadh, is starting to speak. And are currently about 30 kilometres into Kuwait itself, where they have gone firm. And they're now awaiting fresh instructions. During the course of their major action, I can now tell you that they destroyed something between 150 and 200 tanks, approximately 100 infantry fighting vehicles and 100 artillery pieces. The estimates on the prisons of war they have taken vary between two and a half and five thousand and I'm sure you'll appreciate the difficulties we have in providing you with precise figures at the moment. The state of some of the prisons of war is quite pitiful. The weather has been extremely bad in the battlefield area and it's quite clear that they were ill-provided, the prisons of war, uh, with wet weather clothing and cold weather clothing. They're cold, they're hungry, and they're pretty miserable. Some of them haven't <coughs> eaten for days. Now, when they come into our care, we do make good arrangements to make sure that they're given fresh clothing where necessary, and, of course, that they are fed. But that, of course, happens as we get them further back down the chain and into the prisoner of war cages. I said very much earlier on in this campaign that our soldiers feel no antagonism at all for the Iraqi soldiers. Indeed, they feel a great deal of pity for the Iraqi soldiers, and that has manifested itself by our own soldiers as they capture these prisoners of war, making arrangements to give them clothing and providing them with rations out of their own stocks of rations before they go back into the system. Our confirmed casualties, as of 6 o'clock local this evening, are 13 dead and 10 wounded. Now, there was an incident yesterday in which an American A-10 inadvertently fired on two of our infantry fighting vehicles. The aircraft was one of several which had been called in to deal with an enemy position, and the incident itself is, of course, under investigation. The incident accounted for nine of our dead. You will understand that that is a matter of particular sadness, both to ourselves and to the American forces. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have to say this evening, and I'd be pleased to take your questions. Can you say, Colonel, which regiment the APCs were from? The APCs were working with the 3rd Regiment, the 3rd Battalion of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. Can you give us any more information about exactly what happened, what the sort of vehicle they were travelling in, uh, what time of day? The soldiers were travelling in the Warrior infantry fighting vehicle, and I can't give you any more detail than I have. As I say, it is under investigation. Was this the only incident of friendly fire? I'm sorry? Was this the only incident of friendly fire? That is the only incident of which I have facts to give you. Colonel, can you what, give was it the only incident of friendly fire? I think I've answered your question. Uh, Colonel, can you give us any enemy casualty figures today? Any enemy casualty Iraqi figures? Uh, no, I think as I explained last night, we're actually not counting bodies. Uh, we don't want to get into that sort of game, I'm sorry. Uh, I know you're not counting bodies, let me stated in another way that may answer the same question. There was a, a, the inability to actually account for the dead during the bombing that preceded the ground war. As you've visited the theater, as your troops have visited the theater, are they giving you an idea of what it was like? Is it worse than you thought it was? Did you, was there more uh, damage during the bombing than you were able to judge mm -hmm. prior to the, the visit by the ground? Clearly, there was a lot of damage caused by the bombing campaign and the artillery bombardment. I don't have specific details to pass on to you at the moment. Can we go to the front here, please? Uh, two questions. 
can you can you in any way characterize the casualties? And I mean, in terms of were there a lot of casualties? Were there very few on on the Iraqi side? And and secondly, can you talk at all about the quality of the what I presume are regular army units that you faced? I really wouldn't want to go into the business, if you don't mind, of characterizing the casualties. As to the quality of the soldiers, the resistance they've put up has been patchy. Indeed, as I said yesterday, some of it has been reasonably firm, some of it has been token resistance only. None of it has been totally committed. Could I ask, sir, um, did I understand correctly in the past that uh, vehicles had been fitted with a device which would enable planes to discern whether or not they were friendly, and were our vehicles fitted with those devices? Yes, we have gone to great lengths to try and avoid the sort of incident which I have just described, both by putting recognition features on our vehicles, and the vehicles were fitted with recognition features, and by our procedures for de-conflicting um, friendly fire, from friendly forces. Now, the cruel fact of war is that no matter how many procedures you put in place, this sort of incident does happen. There has never been a war where it has not happened. So the procedures we have used, I am sure, have kept the sort of incident right to the barest minimum, but we simply cannot rule it out altogether. I would still like to know a little bit more about the incident. Can you at least tell us if it happened at day or night? Was it in the heat of battle? Uh, what more can you tell us about this? I can tell you quite clearly that it was in the heat of battle, uh, but the remaining circumstances of the incident are under investigation, and it would be totally remiss of me to make any comment further than that. Colonel, are you saying that there were no other incidents of friendly fire to your knowledge? I answered your question earlier no, on. No, you didn't quite. To the back, please. Were there any of the wounded? Uh, that you cited ten wounded. Were any of those... I'm sorry. Uh, the friendly fire incident, did it produce any wounded? You mentioned I, deaths, but I did it produce any I can only give wounded? you the figures I have given you at the moment. I'm sorry, that's, that's the only information I have. Yes, madam. What was the weather during the friendly fire? What was the weather like? I don't have details on the weather, I'm sorry. Over here. You said you uh, met your objective and you're, you're in Kuwait now. Are you facing any uh, opposition? Or is it quiet where the... Uh, first armored is? No, the, the division's advance today has met with little or no opposition at all. Colonel, can you um, give us any indication of the number of Iraqi wounded who've passed through first armored division's medical facilities? Yes, I can. To date, we have had 33 Iraqi wounded evacuated through our casualty evacuation chain. Can you tell us with the tanks that were, um, uh, should you say, destroyed, were they destroyed or destroyed captured? and abandoned? And abandoned. Can you give us an idea of the split on them? How many were destroyed? How many no, were... No, I'm sorry. I don't have that sort of detail. Uh, any details about the other um, dead and wounded uh, in our campaign so far? Other than the ones I just, just mentioned yes. to you, the total is 13 dead and 10 wounded. How the others met their deaths and were wounded, I'm afraid I have no details on that at all. Can you tell us what uh, are these recognition features consist of? What kind of things are they? Are these symbols painted on the on the vehicle or do they consist of something else? No, they are clear recognition vehicles which are recognition features which are marked on the vehicles. If you'll forgive me, I won't go into the precise details okay, even symbols now. Painted on. Symbols painted on, uh, they cannot be mistaken. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, you mean? There, there's, there's a, wrong, a wrong phraseology. Let me go back on that. They are painted on the vehicles there. Yes, madam. Uh could you tell us whether the battle um, involving this friendly fire incident had anything to do with, the Repu with Republican Guard units? Uh, we, to my knowledge, were not in contact with the Republican Guard at the time. Yes, ma'am. Um, the United Nations has apparently uh, been told by Iraq uh, in the last hour or so uh, that Iraq would accept demands for reparations, abandon claim to Kuwait in return for a ceasefire. Could you comment on that, please? I think you'd be better off uh, addressing that question to the Commander-in-Chief when he appears later tonight. You talked to us a bit yesterday about the movements of this armored division, but I still don't have a clear picture whether these 150 to 200 <coughs> tanks destroyed or abandoned, whether the great majority of them were from one pitched battle or it's five here, five there, five at the next stop. Yeah. The total number of casualties relates, obviously, to the division's advance throughout yesterday and into today. Very few of them today, the vast majority 
in the battle yesterday which covered some considerable amount of ground. Yeah, Colonel, have you come across any Iraqi vehicles that have had the coalition markings on them in the field? I have no information on that at all, I'm sorry. Colonel, um, I'm sorry, I'm a little unclear. Are you saying that our, our fighting vehicles have electronic devices fitted of the same sort that planes have, or are they relying solely on painted markings? No, I didn't say anything about electronic, uh, electronic gadgets. There are no electronic gadgets. These are visual recognition signals. Can you tell us more, a little more about the, the procedures which um, are in operation to avoid, avoid friendly fire incidents? I don't think it would be appropriate to go into the procedures, if you don't mind. Uh, we are still fighting an enemy, and they might be able to make use of that. What are the Allies doing with the Iraqi bodies in areas under the Allies' control? What arrangements are you making to send them back home to Iraq? Uh, we are doing our bit to clear the battlefield. Burial details are at work now. I don't want to go into any more detail, if you don't mind. Uh, because I don't wish to. I just want to clear this up. You're not talking about symbols. Sorry, could be, sorry I can't hear you. Could, could, could I ask? You're not talking about actual symbols being painted. I assume you're talking about certain properties of the paint which can be recognized by friendly uh, means. The symbols are clearly marked on our vehicles. My, my point is, I, I think we're not talking about symbols as such, but certain properties of the paint that can be recognized by electronic means uh, by friendly forces. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I can't go into details on that. I don't have the sort of detail you're off. Can I take just two more questions, please? Could, could I go over here? Do you, can you give us any, um, any idea of the rough timing of the friendly fire incident at all? Do you have that detail? I don't have that sort of detail, I'm afraid. That is all part of the investigation. One from over here. Uh, can I, would you kindly give a clear picture of the city of Kuwait, what it looks like and what are the uh, oppositions or uh, hindrances to, to have the visual... Complete, com complete picture of the whole city. Is it safe to travel there? If I, if I may, I'll leave all descriptions of Kuwait City to the Commander-in-Chief when he appears later this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And that was the British military briefing in Riyadh by Colonel Barry Stevens, who would not answer a question about the apparent offer by Iraq to fulfil more of the United Nations resolutions. Iraq has apparently said it would accept UN Security Council resolutions demanding it drop its claim to Kuwait and agree to consider war damages if the Allies agreed to a ceasefire in the Gulf War. Prisoners of war would apparently be freed shortly after a ceasefire came into effect, it said. And Baghdad Radio said the conditional offer to accept, in, under the terms of the two things I just mentioned, resolutions number 662 and 674, was made by Foreign Minister Tariq Aziz in a letter to United Nations Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuellar. Christopher Lee, uh, here in the studio, a letter from Tariq Aziz to Perez de Cuellar containing these conditions. It's a curious way to go about things, and presumably it's not going to make a cause a ceasefire to break out straight away. Well, I think the timing of the ceasefire, without being too cynical, will be decided by the president, and that'll have, and to some extent, it will be on the report from General Schwarzkopf on the rate of the battle, the, or the rate it is going, because the achievement is quite clear, uh, and so is the ambition. And it's when that ambition and achievement sort of coincide that that's when we're far more likely to get uh, a ceasefire. Um, but it's interesting that last night, Pete Williams, who is the senior Pentagon spokesman said that if um, the Iraqis wanted a ceasefire, they would actually have to write out, they would have to write down their acceptance. It wouldn't be simply enough to announce it. And that was the first time that I'd heard him to be as definite as that. Uh, Paul Reynolds is also here in the studio. 662 and 674 are the resolutions which Iraq is apparently now willing to comply with. It's not enough, is it, apart from anything else? I mean, all 12 have got to be complied with. Yes, that's right, uh, Nick, and it just shows you the Iraqis are sort of miscalculating again and are leaving everything far too late. The UN decided last night, and the Russians have now come on board this, that they will have to make a comment accepting all 12 in a sort of blanket kind of statement and uh, six, 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 um, six, four is well. One of them is about Kuwait. Six, six, two, and six, seven, six, four. Six, six, two, two. Yes. Further demand that Iraq rescind its actions, purporting to annex Kuwait. Well, in fact, he's probably done that. He probably did that in his speech a couple of nights ago. But uh, the Allies are requiring more, more or less, that he gives up all claim to Kuwait. 
And the other one, 672, I think. 6674 is the one. 674. I have the benefit is, um, of a screen here and you don't, so I've, I'm well, ahead. I've got it in front of me here, that's right. It reminded Iraq that under international law it's responsible for any loss, damage or injury arising in regard to Kuwait and third states. Invite states to collect relevant information with a view to such arrangements as may be established um, for restitution or financial compensation. It doesn't actually call on Iraq to make compensation this resolution, but it's always been interpreted in that very hardline way. But as I say, here is Iraq. I mean, Mr. Aziz, desperately trying to get a ceasefire out of nothing, and um, it's it's not going to work. I mean, the State Department has already said it's not enough. And as I think we were saying earlier, that uh, you, you can always find a loophole in this and say they've not met the requirements, because what matters now is to complete the military business, not to get bogged down, as the Iraqis would wish us to do, in the diplomatic niceties. It's too late for that. I'm not allowed to tell you where the front units are, but suffice it to say that we're quite close to the Kuwaiti border and uh, the forward units have, have been steaming forward all day. Um, they have reached a point now where it's likely that they will stop. Uh, there is a general expectation among the commanders that the Americans um, will declare an end of hostilities very soon, possibly uh, within the coming hours, but that isn't clear. But for the moment, the British forces are static. They're in a defensive position and they're simply uh, maintaining uh, the western belt of this huge allied push that has gone on. Uh, we've got the Americans to our north, and we've got uh, Marines and Arab forces uh, a little further south, and all this amounts to um, a huge belt of allied armor um, against which any Iraqi forces would simply uh, bounce. They would have no chance whatever of breaking out of our particular sector. Well, obviously, you, you're talking here about a cordon which one can imagine, even without much military knowledge, uh, may well be encircling perhaps the Republican Guard. Is there any sign of them yet or action from them? Um, I, I find it slightly difficult to uh, describe the bigger picture as far as Republican Guard uh, go. I have heard it reported on the World Service that the, uh, the, the Medina Division, one of the three Republican Guards, was engaged by the uh, Americans and has been destroyed. Uh, as far as the other two are concerned, my uh, information is that they have gone north. Uh, they have fled across the Euphrates River, and they seem to have escaped this cordon. Uh, we know that the Americans are bombing very heavily up along the, the road that leads from Kuwait up towards Baghdad. Um, they have been engaging armor up there. Uh, apparently the roads are blocked. Uh, with, they're choked with traffic, and all this... Um, Iraqi armor that has been squeezed up into the choke point of northwest Iraq is trying to flee for its life. But I don't know exactly what is happening up there, only that, that they are under very he heavy attack indeed. So it may be that the Republican Guard, uh, at least two divisions, although they have escaped, uh, may not have um, escaped the, um, well, the, the bombing that the Americans are now inflicting on them. Joe Paley, don't go away. Chris Lee would like a word. I'd like one more afterwards. Hi, Joe. Um... A thought. Did you say that the two divisions had got across the Euphrates? That was the information which I had, that they had fled north and then turned east. Right. Now, do you happen to know whether they were the armoured or the infantry divisions? Um, I, I, I really can't tell you, Chris. Right. Um, I, I think that they are the, I think they are the armoured divisions, but I, I just, I, I, because I'm, you know, just with my own particular battle group, my right. own right. picture of the of the wider front is, is very limited. Right. One of the points I wanted to take up with you, Joe, was whether or not you'd heard about the initiative, apparently, that's coming from Baghdad, an offer from Tariq Aziz to fulfill a few more of the United Nations resolutions, those concerning reparations, uh, the return of prisoners of war, uh, and the giving up the claims on Kuwait, and whether that had filtered through to you yet. No, it hasn't, but it, it certainly fits in with the way in which the Iraqis have uh, basically up sticks and fled because they clearly are trying to salvage what's left of their armor within Kuwait. Um, and, and the sooner they can encourage an ending of hostilities, obviously the, the more they will be able to save. Um, but the, I mean, the commanders here assume that uh, it, it is only a matter of time so that they're, they're, they're taking full advantage of the, of the situation to try to destroy as many tanks as they can. I was impressed by the, the point that you made when you said that you felt there was a feeling amongst the British forces there that the Americans might call a halt to this within a few hours, because the impression we're getting here is that the Americans are determined to press on. The statement from the White House says that the, the war will be prosecuted because the Iraqis have failed to fulfil large numbers of these resolutions. 
Yes, I think, though, the Americans, I mean, the assumption among commanders here is that the Americans will find it very difficult to carry on destroying the armor uh, within Iraq, that there comes a point where uh, they have a achieved the objective set by the United Nations resolutions, and therefore to, to prosecute the war further would, would seem to be taking it too far. But, I mean, these are simply thoughts that British land commanders have on the ground. They're not necessarily uh, finding any favor within the White House or the Pentagon. So, I mean, that, that, that's simply an observation from somebody who is who is down here with the British forces. Um, what I, I know that Chris is listening. There's, there's just one point I would like to make which would interest him, and that is the, it's to do with the great deception plan which the British uh, used to try to um, persuade the Iraqis to confuse them as to exactly where they were. Because, uh, it was based upon the assumption that the Iraqis knew that, that wherever the desert rats were, it was likely to be the main focus of engagement. So in the weeks leading up to uh, the time that we crossed the border, um, the... the really by electronic means and by radio means, uh, the, uh, the British had created the illusion that we were uh, just slightly east of this uh, river valley that runs down the Kuwait-Iraq border, this thing called the Wadi al-Batin, that we were just slightly to the east of it. And it was, uh, it was felt that by creating this deception, uh, the Iraqis would feel that that was where the main attack would come. Now, when we attacked alongside 7th Corps, the American 7th Corps, uh, we did so on the second day. Other units went in first, and then our attack went up 80 miles or so to the west of the Kuwaiti border. We went up about 40 kilometers into southern Iraq and then turned sharp right and went directly for the Kuwaiti border. So that's been the progress all the way along. But it, if the deception plan worked, and it'll be very interesting to hear what the Iraqis say at the end of all this, um, my guess is that they will feel that we were, launch, uh, we were planning to launch an invasion directly into Kuwait itself. What about the spirits of people there under the sort of operation you've been talking about, this extraordinarily rapid advance and the action that have taken, actions that have taken place en route? Well, it's taken everybody by surprise. There's a general feeling of astonishment among the British soldiers that, that they should meet so little resistance. Uh, people were, were, were keyed up for weeks ahead. They, they thought they were going into, oh, into the utmost danger, into a fight that could last possibly for weeks. They thought that casualties would be very heavy indeed. They assumed that they would be engaging uh, Republican Guard units and that, you know, the Challenger tank, which is among the best in the world, it said, would be pitted against the T-72, which is another of, of those among the best, that, that, you know, they would really have a battle on their hands. Well, I mean, it was just basically sweeping aside the dross of Saddam Hussein's army. Um, they, they've had no contest. They've been coming up against uh, T-55 tanks. I, I had a look at one this morning before it was destroyed. It's just basically a, it, it's, it's a bean tin. It, 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 it offers no protection. It has uh, a small gun. It's, it's a pathetic piece of equipment to, to pit against a tank like the Challenger. But that's all that they left. Listening, I guess, to Baghdad Radio and these various uh, offers coming out of there, Adam. Well, it's, it's very simple. It's really one basic letter sent yesterday from Tarek Aziz to Paris de Quelia, and it's very bleak in, in its wording, and it doesn't leave any suggestion that there's any other resolutions or any other negotiating to do. They are simply saying they've agreed to abide by 660, we know. They will also agree to 662 and 674, they are the, the resolutions demanding annexation and the release of all hostages. If the UN Security Council, and I quote, issues a resolution providing for an immediate ceasefire for halting all land, sea and air military operations and considers as non-existent and consequently null and void all the bases on which Council Resolutions 661, 665 and 670 are based. And as we know, those are the, uh, the uh, resolutions that introduce sanctions and the naval and air blockades. So th there is nothing else in the letter. Well, that's a conditional offer, isn't it? That it's presumably a, allows Marlon Fitzwater to say it's a conditional it offer. It is absolutely a conditional offer. It, there's no question about it. We will agree to these two additional resolutions if you do that. First, a ceasefire, and second, nullify those three resolutions. And there's no question about it at all. And then it says, separately to that, the government asserts its full willingness immediately after a ceasefire to, re to release the prisoners of war and return them to their homelands. Yeah, this, Adam, I've just seen this letter too on the monitoring and this this appear as you say this appears to be the single offer just there was a little bit of confusion a few minutes ago about this Reuters story saying the Iraqi envoy says Baghdad accepts remaining resolutions now no 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 it I would no no wait a minute I would dis discount that one and go back to this letter uh, from Tariq Aziz and uh, this appears to be the only document you know on which we can have a 
a serious discussion, um, unless Mr Alan Bari knows something his foreign minister doesn't. Paul Reynolds, unlikely. Adam Rayfield, thank you for a moment. We're going to go at uh, 4.33 to a summary of news from Clive Rosslyn. Iraq has this afternoon announced that it's ready to abandon its claim on Kuwait and accept demands for reparations in return for a ceasefire. In a broadcast on Baghdad Radio, the Iraqis also said they were prepared to release prisoners of war shortly after a ceasefire. They said the United Nations was being informed of the offer. But the American State Department has described the move as falling short of what's required. Within the past few minutes, the Iraqi ambassador to the UN has said his country will accept all the resolutions. A British military spokesman in Saudi Arabia has disclosed that nine British soldiers were killed when an American A-10 tank buster aircraft mistakenly attacked their armoured vehicles. It happened yesterday as the British 1st Armoured Division continued its push into southern Iraq. The men's relatives have been informed. An investigation is underway. The men were among the 13 British soldiers who are now confirmed as having been killed. Coalition forces in the Gulf are continuing a massive operation against Iraq's armies. The first objective of the war, the liberation of Kuwait, is now assured. Allied armies are in the capital, Kuwait City, and the last pockets of Iraqi resistance have ended. Elsewhere, the Iraqi retreat has continued, and the main fighting is now going on inside Iraq's borders. Iraqi forces in the south of the country are said to be almost completely encircled, and their escape routes are being cut. The Prime Minister, Mr Major, has said the British ambassador to Kuwait is being sent back to Kuwait City to an embassy now under the control of British troops. One of his duties will be to check on the welfare of British citizens who stayed behind during the occupation. A gunman has opened fire on three American government officials at a hotel in the centre of Berlin. One was slightly wounded. Police said the attacker was of Arab appearance. Clive Rosslyn, thank you. City News Now, the half-point cut in interest rates and the prospects for rebuilding Kuwait have prompted a surge in share prices in London and New York. Ahmed al Robayan addressed journalists. After liberating the city, Royal Saudi Land Forces units raised the Saudi flag over our embassy in Kuwait City. Forces from friendly Arab and Muslim countries have also participated in the liberation of Kuwait City by providing rear area security. Ships of the Royal Saudi, British and American navies continue with mine sweeping operations of the Kuwaiti coast. Eight mines were discovered, six were destroyed. In the last 24 hours, American forces in different incidents destroyed over 100 T-72 and T-55 tank and numerous other number of vehicles, including personal carriers, trucks, ABCs. British forces destroyed 100, 150 to 200 tanks and 100 APCs. The Joint Forces has completed over 106,000 air sorties, of which the Royal Saudi Air Force conducted 6,600. Due to the large number of enemy prisoners of war taken in the last 24 hours, a solid number cannot be given, but estimates presently stands between the 45 and 50,000 total. I'll be pleased to take your questions. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, of, the, of the Iraqi tanks and vehicles that are on the desert, left unmanned. How many of them are destroyed and how many are in good shape but have been deserted? Is there a percentage, half and half? You're finding a lot of stuff that is still usable? Uh, there is a lot that are still usable, but with the fog of war on, it is very difficult to have uh, numbers, uh, neither bodies nor equipment. What happens to it? Does it become the property of the... <coughs> Nothing happened to it yet. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us something of the plans to deal with the, all these prisoners? Um, are you simply going to send them back to Iraq when this is over? Uh, what about those who, you know, may pose sort of uh, problems, I mean, that are, that are, you know, problem soldiers? Will they go back as well? As uh, uh, normal war ends, uh, the prisoners of war will be kept in the camps and then the coalition countries uh, will have negotiations with the Iraq government because also the Iraqis do have uh, coalition forces, prisoners of war, and it depends upon the agreements 
that will result from those negotiations what will be done in the future, which I cannot judge right now. From the reports that we're seeing, it appears that many of these um, Iraqis are surrendering voluntarily. They're criticizing the Iraqi regime. Yes. Uh, would you force these people to go back, or are they free to stay here? Uh, all Iraqi soldiers that have been captured or gave themselves up after the beginning of Desert Storm are EPWs. Yes, ma'am. Colonel, um, you said at the outset that the liberation of Kuwait had been completed. Does this mean that all of the Iraqi troops are now out of Kuwait, or are there some still straggling northward? There are a, a limited number of pockets of resistance uh, apparently that the reason is the lack of communications that maybe the command of this unit doesn't know what's going on around it because of they are not capable of calling their commands and find out about the overall results yes ma'am uh, do you have updated casualty figures for Arab forces? Uh, it hasn't been changed since yesterday. The 13 that yes, you last gave? Does that include Egyptian casualties? This includes the Egyptian do casualties. Do you have a breakdown? Uh, I can carry this question for tomorrow. I'll take the last question, please. We're limited with the time. Sir, yes, sir. I'd like to ask you, uh, when you, when you uh, a late report that's come in, saying that Iraq has agreed to new parts of the UN resolutions, one dealing with reparations. Iraq has announced that according to these sources that they will accept the reparations part of the UN resolution, uh, also abandon claims to Kuwait, and also exchange POWs in exchange for a ceasefire. Now, I don't expect you to give your country's position on this, but does this at least encourage you, these reports? Uh, I think you guessed right. I, I am not capable of giving any political situation <laughs> regarding this matter. A sense of humor from Colonel Ahmed al Rabayan of the Saudi uh, Army there briefing reporters in Riyadh. Now, I should let you know that uh, President Bush has said the war is almost over, and, and his spokesman, Marlon Fitzwater, said the president was turning his attention more to post war questions. He's also specified, Mr. Fitzwater, some of the resolutions which haven't been specifically dealt with, i.e., numbers 661, 665, and 667, dealing roughly with a trade embargo and the release of foreigners. And I will talk about more about that in a moment. But we have, I think, just got hold of an interview with the Iraqi ambassador to the United Nations, Dr. Alan Bari, which may clarify the rather confusing confusing signals coming from Baghdad at present. Yes, I have requested a meeting to convey to him uh, the new decision by the Iraqi government on the highest level to abide by all the resolutions of the Security Council, which are yet to be implemented. Of course, some of them have already been implemented, and we have completed our withdrawal from Kuwait. The last soldier actually left Kuwait dawn today, local time although the American and other uh, forces kept attacking our forces. Uh, as far as the other resolution, we are ready if the Security Council would announce a ceasefire resolution. You are, you, are you going to ask the Security Council to declare a ceasefire today? Yes. Well, uh, I, I hope they would meet today and would uh, pass such a resolution. Have you informed anyone else officially? Have you informed any, any members of the Allied Coalition or the Secretary General? No, no, I am first the President of the Security Council and later, of course, the, the Secretary General as well. What about this requirement that it be done in writing? Well, it is, it's a written letter. You have a letter? Yes. From, from the Foreign Minister. Could you read it? Is this not acceptable no, to the Americans? No, I have it addressed to the President of the Security Council. If, if this is not acceptable to the Americans, what would Well, they have so many walls and so many mountains, okay, I mean, they could go there to too. Move the once again, well, it's up to them. I mean, we, as far as we are concerned, we are dealing with the Security Council. Although we know that the United States somehow dominated the Security Council, but legally we are a member of the United Nations and we'll be dealing with the Security Council. Could you summarize the letter for us? Well, I just uh, have done that. Uh, namely, that Iraq is ready to implement all the resolutions which have not been implemented yet, and there are some other resolutions that have really expired, uh, and or for the Security Council to resent them concerning the air and uh, naval blockade, as well as uh, the other penalties. Uh, 
Uh, well, I don't know about that. Uh, all what we are concerned now, all what we have to say that we are ready to implement that resolution. As to the mechanism, as to the procedure, that would be to be worked out, I mean, by the Security Council itself. And just if, if, if the point clarification, if I may. If, if there is a ceasefire, what would uh, Iraq do about uh, the attacks on Israel and Saudi Arabia? Well, if the war of the ceasefire stopped, all hostilities would stop. Including those against Israel? I should think so, yes. Ambassador, does your answer depend on a ceasefire? Yes. So, so it is conditional, you mean? Well, let's forget about this conditional. I mean, you, 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 unless you are alive, you cannot walk. I mean, so don't tell me that uh, it's a condition to uh, be alive in order to walk. So you, have, you cannot implement a resolution without a ceasefire. Dr. Alan Bari, the UN ambassador of Iraq, speaking there, and Marlon Fitzwater was asked about those remarks, apparently, and when told that uh, the government, the Iraq government, had accepted all resolutions, he told reporters, I would be very cautious about that UN report. Ask him, i.e. Dr. Alan Bari, if he's had contact directly with Iraq and where he's getting that. In other words, he seems to be suggesting that Dr. Alan Bari may be speaking beyond his brief. Paul Reynolds is still a fascinating interview and still apparently conditions. Yes, I think so. The mercurial Dr. Alan Bari, who has managed to muddy the waters in the past, is doing so again, because he has in his pocket a letter from Tariq Aziz, which has in fact already been broadcast on Baghdad radio, and we have the text of it here. And although he was not prepared to give it to the reporters waiting in the lobby of the Security Council building in New York, uh, his radio has already broadcast it, and we have, we have it here. And, you see, it is conditional. That's the problem. Um, it says that Iraq has all... The letter says it has already decided to withdraw from Kuwait. That's Resolution 660. I would also like to inform you, says Mr. Aziz, that the Iraqi government agrees to abide by 662 and 674. That's annexation of Kuwait and uh, reparations and injury compensation. If, if, and the word if is there, the Security Council issues a resolution providing for an immediate ceasefire and considers as non-existent uh, and null and void all the bases on which Council Resolutions 661, 665 and 670 were adopted, and those are the sanctions resolution. So it's completely... Um, um, to implement this, uh, these, these punitive economic measures does not really apply to Iraq. Okay, it calls, it says that Iraq should get out of Kuwait and all that kind of thing, which, um, you know, Iraq is now, has now done or is doing or appears to be doing. And he simply makes the point that naval blockades, for example, do not apply to Iraq. He says that some um, uh, uh, resolutions relating to foreign embassies, for example, those no longer apply. So it's not that Iraq, in principle, will not agree to these resolutions, but that simply, in some cases, historical events have simply overtaken the resolution and in others, they simply don't apply to Iraq. It requires action not from Iraq, but from other countries, such as the sanctions resolution. But briefly, Chris, if Dr. Alan Bari goes on saying, un unless there's a ceasefire, or until there's a ceasefire, or there must be a ceasefire, that is a condition, and it is one which quite clearly the Allies are not going to accept. Absolutely, but I think what he's hoping to do is bring pressure to bear now in the council. I think he's mistaken if he thinks that tactic is going to work, but I think he's going to use this letter from Tariq Aziz as, if you like, a lever to try and galvanise the Security Council into action. My own feeling, though, is given the statements that have already come out of the White House and the State Department, it's a ploy which is not going to work. Chris Gunness at the United Nations, thank you very much indeed. We shall await for further clarification as the evening draws on of what the Iraqis really mean by their offer to fulfil all relevant United Nations resolutions. But in a moment, we're going to go over to Longwave as well to join the PM. And after that, of course, there'll be the 6 o'clock news, News FM, back on the air at 6.30. It's PM at 5 PM with Hugh Sykes and Wendy Austin. Tonight, Iraq tells the UN we will obey your resolutions. America say that's not enough. Allied troops control Kuwait City tonight, but nine British soldiers die under American fire. And the Princess Royal tells PM about the forgotten refugee tragedy in Central Africa. Good evening. The news summary is read by Clive Rosslyn. The Iraqi ambassador to the United Nations has said his country accepts all 12 UN resolutions on Kuwait. He said Iraq had already implemented some of the resolutions, but a ceasefire was now needed so the remaining ones could be implemented. The White House has reacted cautiously to the announcement, and we'll have more on this in a moment. 
It's been revealed that nine British soldiers were killed when an American A-10 aircraft mistakenly attacked their armoured vehicles. A British spokesman in Saudi Arabia said the incident happened yesterday in the heat of battle in southern Iraq. It brings the number of British servicemen killed in the fighting to 13. A fierce tank battle is underway west of the southern Iraqi city of Basra between American army units and the Iraqi Republican Guard. About 450 tanks are said to be involved. Officials in Washington say the Iraqis have lost at least 57 of their most modern T-72 tanks. The last remaining pockets of resistance in Kuwait City were overwhelmed this morning. There were, have been scenes of wild jubilation in the streets as Allied units poured into the city. Britain's ambassador is already on his way back. One other story, banks and building societies have been cutting their interest rates during the day after the Bank of England lowered its base rate by half of 1% for the second time in a fortnight. The move has been welcomed by the CBI and the Institute of Directors. Clive Rosslyn. Kuwait is now all but free, the Allies said tonight. Iraqi forces are now almost completely encircled, coalition commanders in the Gulf believe. Meanwhile, during the last hour or so, Baghdad Radio and Iraq's ambassador to the United Nations say that all outstanding UN resolutions on the invasion of Kuwait will now be accepted if there's a ceasefire. Tonight's news that the main objectives of the war may be close at hand, perhaps even an end to the war altogether, was overshadowed by grim news earlier this afternoon from the battlefield. Thirteen British soldiers have been killed in action, nine of them killed by American fire. Their families have been told. First to the United Nations, where within the last hour, the Iraqi ambassador, Dr Abdul Amir al-Ambari, said his country had accepted at the highest level all the outstanding UN Security Council resolutions, if and when the council would declare a ceasefire. I received instruction, a written instruction from my government to convey to the President of Security Council that Iraq is prepared to first uh, complete its withdrawal from Kuwait. As a matter of fact, we have done it. The last soldier of Iraqi forces left Kuwait dawn uh, today, local time. That's as far as resolution 660. We are also ready to abide and implement all the other resolutions of the Security Council. Should the Security Council issue a ceasefire and all hostilities should be stopped. And that, of course, would cover resolution 662 regarding the annexation of Kuwait, as well as 674, regarding the whatever uh, preparation or uh, other things. As far as the other resolution concerning the naval as well as the air blockade, this is of course for the Security Council to abolish. Uh, as far as we are concerned, we are, they have ceased to be effective or relevant to the situation. The Iraqi ambassador to the United Nations speaking a short time ago. So what's the Allied response? First to Washington and our correspondent there, David McNeil. David, what's been the response from President Bush? There's been a firm and uncompromising response from the White House. This is not good enough. You'll remember President Bush wants Saddam Hussein himself to personally and publicly uh, renounce and, and, uh, his aggression and accept all the UN resolutions. Specifically, Mr Fitzwater at the White House said it wasn't good enough because it was conditional. It was conditional on a ceasefire. And although the Iraqis say that the naval blockade, and presumably they also mean the economic blockade, are no longer relevant uh, simply because... Iraq says it's withdrawn from Kuwait. That's not the White House view at all. They say they're very relevant. They may have to remain in force to deny Iraq resupply powers for its military and to put further pressure on Iraq economically should it not abide by these uh, UN resolutions. There seems, to put it mildly, to be some confusion over precisely what Iraq is accepting. The ambassador seemed to say there that they were accepting all 12 resolutions. On the other hand, I gather that Marlon Fitzwater says they've been informed that they're only accepting three of them. Well, that's the point, the three that they're not accepting, uh, according to uh, Marlon. Marlon says they've accepted three, although it's conditional, uh, but they've rejected resolutions providing for economic sanctions, naval blockade, condemnation of aggression, uh, because uh, the Iraqis, it seems, according to the ambassador we've just heard, say that these sanctions don't apply anymore. Well, the Americans and the Allies say they cer most certainly do. Is it the case, do you feel, that uh, President Bush still wants and demands a surrender from Saddam Hussein? Without using the word, that's precisely what he wants. Mr Fitzwater, at his morning briefing, said, our intention is to defeat the Iraqi forces, to do that as thoroughly as possible, including capturing armour and weapons. And he pointed out that the UN resolutions call for stability in the region. And he said, assuming that Saddam Hussein stays in power, that means we'll continue this effort to degrade his military structure. David McNeil, thank you very much. And let's get the latest now on what the Iraqis are saying in Iraq 
And in New York City, joining us now are Christopher Gunnis, the BBC correspondent at the United Nations, and Gerald Butt, one of our correspondents in the Middle East. Jerry, first, what's the latest from Baghdad Radio on which resolutions they're accepting and whether or not they're still conditional on a ceasefire and sanctions ending? Well, as you speak to me, Baghdad Radio news bulletin is going on, and actually they're reading out the text even now as we speak of the uh, letter as read out in their news two hours ago. And that is saying, uh, as you can hear in the background, it, it's saying that uh, two resolutions are accepted, 662, can, uh, that's uh, uh, cancelling the annexation of Q8, and 674, which among other things deals with reparations. And that letter also says that uh, it, the Iraqis regard three other resolutions as no longer applying because of a change in circumstance. So that there is still a clear difference in what's being said in the UN uh, compared with what's being said right now on Baghdad Radio. And so to the UN, Christopher Gunnis, what's the latest from uh, Mr Anba Al Anbari, the Iraqi ambassador? Well, I can only endorse what Jerry Butt has just said. There is a clear discrepancy with what is coming out right now from Baghdad Radio and what the Iraqi ambassador has said to me literally a minute ago. He said that Iraq accepts all the resolutions and will implement all the resolutions. However, he drew a distinction between those resolutions which apply to Iraq, um, such as getting out of Kuwait, and those which apply to everybody else, such as imposing sanctions, such as imposing a naval blockade, and what he appears to be arguing is that while accepting all the resolutions and saying that it will implement all resolutions, some are not necessarily applicable to Iraq. Um, and he also argued that historical circumstances, namely the removal of Iraqi forces from Kuwait, um, has, uh, has removed from force, if you like, those resolutions which were predicated on an Iraqi occupation. Chris, one remark by Marlon Fitzwater this afternoon that I read was an interesting one. He said, treat this with great caution. Ask the Iraqi ambassador to the United Nations where he he's getting his orders from. Well, I know that he does communicate with Baghdad and that he communicates with Baghdad through...